do it. Keith, get out the car. Keith, Keith, don't you do it. Don't you do it. Keith, 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 don't you do it. Did you shoot him? Did you shoot him? Did you shoot him? He better not be fucking dead. The 43-year-old was shot and killed after police say he refused their orders to drop a gun. The prosecutor said Officer Brentley Vinson followed procedure when he pulled out his gun and opened fire. After a thorough review, and given the totality of the circumstances and credible evidence in this case, it is my opinion that Officer Vinson acted lawfully when he shot Mr. Scott. He acted lawfully. We uh, heard from the Scott uh, family today via the lawyer responding to a question from CNN saying that they still have concerns and may seek justice in court. I think it would be safe to say that yes, he did have a gun uh, on his person during the course of this. It's a matter of where that firearm was. Uh, and at the end of the day, whether he had a firearm in his that's not the key question in terms of determining whether or not Chris Scott should have lost his life. It's whether or not that officer should have pulled the trigger and experienced his life based on everything that occurred that occurred during his testimony. Scott's family and the district attorney's office had asked the community to remain calm. Uh, remember, we remember the protest when the story first uh, happened. So Nick Valencia is there. You have been covering the story. You were at the family's news conference. First of all, uh, you know, we know no charges will be brought. How has the community reacted to this? Well, we know that later this evening there is a planned press conference, uh, I should say a planned rally outside of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department by a group, a part of a collective of voices that have been demonstrating here since the very beginning. That's something that they had planned. This is a decision that was uh, dreaded by the family. Uh, a very emotional press conference for Rakia Scott. She was there, her eyes welled with tears at the very mention of her husband's name. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, what the community here, the protesters, the demonstrators had anticipated, which is why they had already planned this rally just days before uh, this announcement was made. Uh, we stopped, the uh, a family attorney stopped short of saying whether or not they were gonna file a civil complaint, but they certainly seem to set that up earlier in a press conference. They say it matters to them that Keith Lamont Scott never raised his hands towards police officers. Uh, they reminded the media that this is an open carry state and that there has to be something more than a gun in a person's hand uh, to qualify or quantify uh, a, a, a use of lethal force or an obvious threat. It's a point that the family attorney elaborated on at that press conference earlier. You have to remember the standards of the department are aggravated they define as the discharge of a firearm, not the possession of a firearm. And we have to look at whether an objectively reasonable officer would determine that merely being in possession of a handgun in some way is such an imminent threat that it justifies pulling the trigger. And I think what you're doing with the gun is an important factor. You have to remember what really complicated things here earlier this year in September, Brooke, when the shooting first happened, was the competing narratives. The family saying that Scott did not have a gun, uh, the police saying that there was physical evidence and eyewitness testimony that put a gun in Scott's hand at the time of the shooting. The family says that they're still processing this decision, they're still processing their own investigation, and that they're waiting for the full caseload of files from the district attorney's office to see what they have and the details that they have in order to decide their next steps. Brooke. All right. Nick, thank you so much, and Charlotte, for us. So we know the decision is official from the district attorney's office. The case, though, uh, may not be over. The family is stating, I could pursue a civil suit. So from more on a legal perspective, uh, let's bring in civil rights attorney and former trial lawyer, Charles Coleman, Jr. And also joining us, um, a, a friend of Charlotte officer, friend from Bible study, uh, Officer Benson's former NFL player, Michael Skurlock. So, gentlemen, thank you both so much. And, and Michael, let me just start with you. You know, I don't know the last time you saw Officer Benson, but um, as someone who lives in the community, who's been hearing how folks have been reacting, what, what was your response to hearing no charges to be filed? Well, I think most of the individuals who I've spoken with uh, thus far since I've heard the DA's uh, information 
was primarily, uh, I think, similar to what we felt before, just let all the facts and the details come out prior to um, of the protests. And so I think uh, the DA did a great job of, of putting the puzzle together and allowing the public to see how everything uh, went step by step. Charles, to you, and there's a couple of factors I wanted to bring up that Nick uh, mentioned, you know, state of North Carolina, uh, open carry law uh, of guns. Um, how, you know, to his point on you can't just, how would that impact an officer, let's say, approaching a scene like this? Well, I think it raises an interesting question in terms of policing in open carry states. We saw the similar, a similar thing happen in Louisiana with respect to Officer Sterling, who was also armed in an open carry state. And the reality is, look, we can't expect officers to police the same way in open carry states as they would where guns are illegal. Because at the point that someone just has a gun or has possession of a gun, as you heard uh, Keith Scott's family attorney say, that in and of itself does not automatically make them a criminal, especially at the point that the officer has approached. So I think that that raises a very interesting question there. And then now you talk about what action was actually taken. And this was a point that was made by the family attorney again. In that Walter, uh, I'm sorry, in that Keith Scott had not raised his hand or had not raised his arm to those officers. So it really does question or bring into question the level of threat that be, that's being presented. But you heard the details, you know, and it's so it's difficult because of the misinformation, right? Was it a book? Was it a gun? Did he get shot in the back? Was it, you know, as he was being uh, being approached? When you listen, I mean, I hung on every word of that DA because sure. it's important to do that um, based upon what you heard and the evidence they presented. Is that a fair assessment? No charges. It's a fair assessment based on the narrative that's been given to us by the district attorney. And I'm not suggesting that that narrative is, is misinformed or somehow untrue. What I will say, however, is that it would have been no crime if they had figured out a way to subdue Mr. Scott and not kill him. I think that there are other ways and the police have to, have to be able to exercise and explore other means of subduing potential threats or subduing potential targets that does not involve lethal force. Um, Michael, back to you in Charlotte, you know, Nick, our, our reporter there had mentioned there a rally for this evening, and I remember when we had talked before and we were showing the pictures of the protest, I mean, people in Charlotte were upset, uh, and understandably so at the time. Have you heard from anyone within the community that, that people plan to, um, you know, show their emotion again, take to the streets in your, uh, in your city? No, I have not. Uh, I think, um, again, the DA did, a, a, I think, a fabulous job of uh, aligning all the facts, all the details, and I think the emotions obviously are not as high as they were during the, during the incident itself. So I, I think I think if there is going to be a rally today, I think it's going to be something that's you know, more of a peaceful uh, protest where the people just wanted to voice uh, their opinions. Tell me more about Officer Benson. We had talked about this before, but for people who are just watching for the first time, your, your relationships and Bible study and what kind of man he is. Uh, just a solid, uh, all-around uh, individual. Uh, been, a, been a friend for, for many years. And, you know, there's not a, there's not a lot uh, that you can say that, that, you know, he's just a fabulous person. You know, he, he's been out to uh, youth programs that, that, uh, that, I, that I run and have an opportunity to takes the opportunity to speak to the kids and, and gives them just great insight on his life as a whole. So uh, Brent and, and his wife, uh, the, the up-and-coming uh, little child, have just, uh, just been fabulous uh, people to know for you. What will your message be to him once you get him on the phone? Um, you know, I think the same thing is I think a lot of us may be thinking. I think when, when the facts come out and the details are there, uh, it's, it's relieving to know that, that the decision that was made on that day um, was something that I believe he feels that uh, just confirmed what he felt on that day. Um, Charles, back over to you. Sure. You know, that we've covered too many uh, of, you know, use of force, officer-involved shootings, and oftentimes it's a white police officer and a, and a black young man. In this case, it's an African-American officer and an African-American victim. Sure. And we were chatting before we even came on TV, and so for folks who were saying, well, clearly this wasn't about race, how do you respond to that? I think there are a lot of things that can be said in response to that. The first one is 
it's bigger than race in this instance because it is a conversation about police culture. And, and while I don't take anything away regarding Officer Vincent and the type of character that he may have displayed in other as aspects of his life, the reality is that when we're talking about how police and law enforcement consistently engage communities of color, there's a discrepancy. And so while I may not go as far as to say that this individual officer had some level of discriminatory animus in his heart against Mr. Scott because Mr. Scott was a black man, what I will say again is that how officers over police communities of color is a larger function of police culture and what's wrong. Another thing that I want to point out, point out and we talked about this a bit, a bit uh, before the break, is that when you're talking about this particular incident, or this particular incident, Keith Scott had what is known as a TBI, he had a traumatic brain injury, and that sort of impacted, as per his family, how quick he was able to respond to certain commands and sort of his level of mental capacity. That's relevant when you start talking about race and you start talking about class because oftentimes when you're talking about law enforcement and communities of color or law enforcement and underserved communities, many of these police officers are not trained in terms of how to deal with these sorts of situations appropriately. And in addition to that, many of these communities don't appropriately receive, receive the right amount of resources in order to help prepare them for these sorts of, excuse me, sorts of situations. And so it goes both ways. Right, so it goes both ways. Right. So I think that... There is an element of race here that's not being discussed, but it's not the typical white officer, right. unarmed black black person. Just wanted to bring that up. Charles, thank you so much. Thank and Michael, as always, thank you for joining us as well.